He doesn't want to go to the back. Hallelujah. Owen, you can stay here? Okay. I'll go with you and watch TV back there with you. Amen. Hallelujah. Good to see everybody this morning. And you know we're going to enjoy the word of God this morning. Amen. And you know, um, it's like Pastor was saying. Come out on, we're going to have that fishing, that fishing trip we're planning with the church. And also, uh, those of you, you know, if you don't want to fish or nothing like that, you know, you can come out on a Sunday morning. Amen. And, and also, maybe like two weeks away from that camping trip, we can start teaching about whole baptism. We can start doing that. Amen. And also, uh, Friday night, we're having a prayer service. Amen. Amen. So, it's good to see everybody this morning. And praise be to God. And you know, so, what season are we in? Are you in? Amen. What season are you in? You know, I've been talking about that, and we've been talking and change. Wednesday night was a real good one, and we've been talking about that, Pastor and I. You know, uh, like I quoted scripture last week, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 says, Everything, there's a season, a time for every activity under heaven. Amen. Under heaven. And then let's go to Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. It says, As long as the earth remain, there will be planting and harvest, coal and heat, Summer and winter, day and night. Amen. So in other words, every season we're going to go through something. There's a season for each and every one of us. Amen. Hallelujah. So in other words, this is the way things will always be until the new heaven and the new earth. How many of us know that that's, that's not going to change here on this earth? There's cold, there's heat, there's night and day. Just as long as we're here on earth, that's never going to change. Amen. The only way it's going to change is until the new heaven and the new earth come. What is we're exiting out of this world? That's heaven. That's going to be our new earth. Amen. When you think about the season and the season you're in. See, it's important what kind of season are you in. A spiritual walk with God, you need to know your season. See, one of, one of my concerns for us, you is that you'll be ignorant, meaning the lack of knowledge of the season God had you in. Amen. Here is why. If you don't know what season you are in, you are very little chance of managing that season well. Why not saying that? If you know what kind of season are you in, in the spiritual one, walking with God. If you know what season you're in, you're going to know what to pray about. You're going to know what to, to look at. But if you just barely know a little bit what kind of season you're in, meaning that what you're going through, 
If we barely know what your, your season is, there's small little chance that you're going you're gonna to make it. Why? Because you don't know what kind of season you're in. See, each and every one of us in this place, there's a season of transition. If you don't know what kind of season you're in, you not might even make it to the next level in God. You got to know where you're at with God in a season. See, sometimes we don't know where we're at in the season and pressure is on you and you won't know how to pray about it. And what do you think is going to happen? You might be able to throw in that towel. Why? Because you don't know what season are you in. You don't know what transition are you in. Amen. See, when I first became a minister as a pastor, I didn't know what was going to be ahead of me, what season a transition is going to be. But I realized that I got to pray about it. Amen. So you have very little chance of maintaining the season that you are in right now. Because of the lack of knowledge that we're in with our season. Sometimes we don't know where we are. In the spiritual room with God. Sometimes we got to pray about it. To ask God, what is the transition in my life? If every single day is the same to you as every other day, stewarding each day will never be how you spend your day. And it's really important to you and I believe it's very important to God. See, in the season of transition, it's important to us. It's also important to God. Why? Because a lot of the time that God wants you to a place that where he wants you to transition in your life, in church, in the kingdom. It might be your attitude. It might be stuff that God dislikes. Or he might put you in a position that we're not even familiar with. Amen. That's all of us as God's children. As God's children, let's steward our season. He has he has us in. All of us. We're in a season of transition. And so, in order to steward them well, we have to know what season are we in. Changing is uncomfortable. Transition is uncomfortable. Was it hard for me to change from the Indian religion to coming to church and serve God with all my heart? My heart, Of course, it was uncomfortable. It was hard for me to change from the Indian religion and come to church. Why? Because I was, because I was raised and born in it. It was hard, it was uncomfortable, and I didn't know what to do at times. But I had to change. That transition took place in my life to be a minister and preach to you guys. It was uncomfortable first, but I have to pray about it. I have to take it to God. I didn't cry out to my wife and tell her to pray for me. I have to pray. My wife can't change me. 
You can't change your spouse. You can't change your grown children. Amen. Transitions uncomfortable. Even switching church is uncomfortable sometimes. If you went to another church, a quiet church, if you come to a loud church, a dancing church, it's uncomfortable. Because we're so used to sitting there, but when you come to a loud church that praise God, now you're over here. Like, what are they doing? What are they saying? Speaking in an unknown tongue, it does feel uncomfortable. Transition takes place in the church. Amen. Even when we come in the morning, when we don't even worship, because sometimes we sit there and music playing and all that. Even just raising up your hand, it's hard because we're so used to a live band. But God wants to know where our heart is at with that transition. Amen. But we also have to know what to do. So with each of the four seasons, I'm going to I'm going to a place that there's a four seasons. That I'm kind of going to go in the order of that season. And then I'm going to give you just one thing to think about. If you find yourself or when you find yourself in that season. Amen. So let's go to uh, Genesis 8.22 right here. While the earth removed seed time. And harvest coal in the heat. Winter and summer and day and night shall not cease. Do you think this is going to change? No. It's going to happen. It's going to stay. See, a lot of us, we have a problem. When summer comes, what do we say? Oh, it's too hot. And then winter comes, I wish spring could hurry and come. See, that's a transition we got to get used to. Amen. Then if you go up to Canada, up that place, the sun goes down till 10 o'clock in Canada at night. See, here the sun goes down at 9.30. That's a transition. Amen. See, what I'm saying is, you're headed towards the harvest without the pressure. Without a pressure. Okay? Let's go to Hosanna chapter 10, verse 12. Hosea. No, Hosea. Hallelujah. Hosea, praise be to God. So for yourself righteousness. Go ahead and put it in New Living Translation. That one sounds a whole lot better. This is the same thing, but I want to let people understand what I'm talking about. It says, plant the good seed of your righteousness, and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow out the hard ground of your hearts. For now it is time to seek the Lord, and that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. Amen. Amen. What I'm really getting to right here is plow out the hard ground of your heart. Amen. So we're going to start with a winter season. See, a lot of people, farmers, they plow their field first. 
Why? Because they kill all the weeds and all the weeds that's in there. They, they want to kill all that. So when there rain and snow, it observes the rain and the snow better than a hard ground. Because if it's a hard ground, it runs off the surface. But when you plow it, when you plow that field, now that you're going to go ahead and let all that water absorb and let that water, let that ground suck the water in. For what? For next year's harvest. Because I know because my family, they, they, they plant corn and they plant melons and all that. They do all that and we actually done that before. My children never planted a corn walking up behind a tractor and throw that corn. They say two, two steps, then you throw a corn. And that one year we did that with my children. Amen. Hallelujah. But, you know, I know this verse, this chapter, but I'm using this verse as a principle. And it is just always kind of a serve as a reminder for each and every one of us. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts, for now it is time to seek the Lord that he may come and shower righteousness before you. Plowing comes before rain and snow. Fall plowing destroy many weeds. Amen. Plow up the hard ground of your heart. You know, I think that too many of us hate the plowing season. Why? See, we got to learn how to plow of our hearts. Pull out them bitterness out of your heart. Pull out that gossip out of your heart. That's what I'm talking about, plowing. All the addiction, the drugs, alcohol, everything that you have... A, pornography, everything that you have a problem with. I start plowing it. Take that out of your heart. Plow it because that we're, you're preparing it for a harvest. That's why I'm saying many of us hate the plow. I think that's dangerous. If you have a problem with plowing, then you're not going to to get experience any harvest in your lifetime. Amen. We all have to plow as a Christian. It doesn't matter if we're saved 20 years. It doesn't matter if we're saved 30 years. We got to plow our heart every time. Harvest is which is in your future. Did you know that harvest directly connects to how much plowing you have done in your past? Your harvest connects to your plowing. See, when you're going to go plant a corn, when their corn are growing, they're going to be, you got to go pull out them weeds. If you don't pull them out, guess what happens? It dies. The same way with the word of God. You got to plow your heart. Take that lying spirit out of there. Take the root of that lying spirit. Take the root of that gossip out of your heart. Plow your heart. Why? So that you can grow in God. If you don't plow all those stuff in your heart, what's going to happen? It's going to slow you, shut you down, and you're going to go back to what you used to do. See, a lot of us, we may got delivered, I may got delivered from the Indian religion, but I got to plow my heart still and plant the word of God back into my heart. 
Amen. See, a lot of us, we think, oh, I'm saved, so I'm, I'm not worrying about it. I've been saved for 20 years, so I'm not ever going to go back to that thing. I, I got delivered from marijuana and alcohol. I ain't going to plow my heart. I'm good. Would you rather want to grow and grow and grow and grow and have the knowledge, be wise of the word in God? Human wisdom is nothing to compare to the wisdom of God. Amen. I guarantee you that if you're dependent on your own wisdom, you're going to fall. But if you depend on God that gave you, the wisdom that God gave you, you will never fall. Why do you think I say keep on plowing no matter how long you're in the ministry? It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. We got to keep on plowing and plowing and plowing. The more we plow today, the more we have a shot at the harvest tomorrow after God makes it rain. Amen. Hallelujah. Give me a second here. I'm looking up the scripture. Hallelujah. See, the thing that I was talking about, I'm backing up with the scripture. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3. The things that I was talking about. Okay, it says, this is what the Lord said to the people of Judea and Jerusalem. Plow up the heart, plow up the hard ground of your heart. Do not waste your good seed among thorns. See, you got to pull out them thorns when you plant your watermelon. When you plant your corn, the same way with us. We got to pull them thorns out of our life, our hearts. When you plant a seed in your heart, when you plant a seed of the word of God within you, you got to hold that weed. You got to pull them thorns out of there. All the bitterness, all the lying spirit. Everything that the thing that's not of God you're struggling with, you got to pull them weeds out. Pastor Terrence and I, we can't be at your house 24-7 and say, no, that's wrong. We got to maintain our feel in our heart. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. Praise the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. Okay. Farmers who wait for a perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they will never harvest. So in other words, we can say, Christian who waits for perfect life, no mistake, will never grow. See, a lot of us, we say, I don't want to step in that position because... I said this to my siblings. Amen. So I'm not saying just wait for everything to be perfect. Why do you think the word of God says practice? Practice the word of God. 
So why are we as a Christian waiting for a perfect life? And when there's a God's calling you a position, God is calling you to a church, God is calling you somewhere, the first thing we say is, I've got to get right with God first. But we've been going to church for like 10 years, 15 years, and the church needs help. But the first thing we say is, my life's messed up. My marriage is messed up. I just got an argument with my siblings. I just got an argument with my wife. What about if one morning I came in and said, I'm sorry. I got in an argument with my wife, so I don't want to preach no more. I'm closed down the church. See, a lot of us, we have a problem. We go through stuff. Whatever you go through, you can correct it. A lot of Christians want to go be a door greeter, but I don't pray. Maybe that will keep you on your toes when you hold a responsibility in church. When you're holding responsibility in church, now it's on you. And now you're going to stand before God and humble yourself. Why? Because you want to do excellent for God. Isn't that amazing if that farmer says, oh, there's a cloud coming in. I'm not going to go ahead and cut the hay. I'll just leave it. The hay is getting bigger and bigger. He's never going to cut hay when he's waiting for a perfect day. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The condition, the condition that we're in in the daily life, the mistakes that we go through every daily, every single day, we can fix it. Why do you think Jesus died on that cross? Forgiveness. Do you think Pastor Harley is perfect every single day? I try to. But I always ask God for forgiveness. Or should I be one of them Christians? Oh, I made a mistake so I ain't going to get on that platform. I made a mistake, so I'm not going to go ahead and teach the children back there. What are we waiting for? Amen. And don't, the condition are never going to be perfect in our lives. Never live through a season where the condition were so perfect and so perfect. That's exactly what I thought. I have to be perfect to minister. I have to be perfect to do certain things in ministry. But at least we try. Amen. Since everything's perfect, now is a time. In other words, you know, in other words, what I'm saying is, my wife and I, our marriage is not perfect. Husband and wife in this place, their marriage is not perfect. But what? You know what? There's a forgiveness that Jesus Christ died on that cross for you. So through that, the two married couples can forgive one another. But don't carry the past of what they did wrong. Amen. See, a lot of us, as a married couples... We look at their past and what they did wrong. We use it against them. Forgive means never bring it up no more. Leave it alone and continue trucking being married. Continue trucking heading for God. Keep on trucking to be safe. Not only marriage couple, but also for your, your family, your siblings. 
See, a lot of us, we can get mad at our siblings, but we can forgive them. That's the problem, a lot of us. We hold on to another brother and sister in Christ about their past. Amen. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Like I was saying, each and every one of us, I know, now, if somebody says, I'm perfect, you're lying. Hey, man, I'm not perfect. Let me tell you something. The next step now we walk is by faith. See, if you're not perfect, you got to walk by faith. So we don't wait for our perfect marriage. We don't wait for our perfect relationship with God. God wants you to have a perfect relationship with him, but at least you're trying. I'm not saying don't go to do anything until everything's perfect. What I'm saying is just make sure you don't try and run into something you're not fully ready to step into. Amen. That's why I'm saying transition comes into our lives. Are you ready for that transition every time? No. You're not ready to transition. But guess what? It's going to come no matter what. Why? Because it's part of God's planning. See, it works like this. You can be a basketball player, play res ball outside. You can carry that basketball, carry the ball, foul that person, and thinking that you're good. But if you get on the real basketball court in a tournament, and you don't even know the rules. You just know you're good on the Reds basketball court. And by the time we get on the court, we don't even know the rules. We don't even know what over the back is. We don't even know what pushing is. We don't even know what carry the ball is. We don't even know what assignment like this. We're traveling. That's what I'm talking about. We got to know what, what we're running into. But a lot of the time, through a transition, we don't. Amen. All I got to say is, be prepared no matter what. Every single day, read the word and pray. So when that transition comes, you will be prepared. Amen. I'm going to say this in the kingdom of God. We don't know, even understand the protocol of the palace God is leading them into because it's not yet time. And so what does he do? God gives a season like the fall in our lives. That's why God gives you a season. Sometimes we come to church and then we sit and learn the word and hear the pastor preach. And then we learn, we keep on learning and learning. And now that you know, Ningxi, no, you, you receive an unknown tongue. Ningxi, no, that you start dancing in the spirit. And we didn't even know what it was. That's a transition right there. There are protocols in church. We have rules in church. Everything's done in order in church. How could God bless a church when it's out of order? Amen. 
See, like I said, God gave us season. Each and every one of us is like. See, like for, for me, I'll give an example. I was been an armor bear for 17 years, I believe so. But there is a season came that one day my pastor said, You're out of the nest. You're going to Gallup, New Mexico. Was I happy? No, but I was thinking, all you do is just preach, that's it. Just preach really good. Make sure the anointing's upon your life. No. There is more to it. In the progress, I started learning. Amen. I remember only thing my wife told me every single time, don't let pride step in. When you have pride, you're asking for a great fall, babe. Don't let that pride step in. That's all I heard from my wife. And she prayed for me. She cried out. But in the progress of that, I started preaching. Did I preach the way I, used to, I preach now? No. I learned. It was hard. It was plowing. I was plowing. The same way with you guys, children of God. You can step into a position that you're not comfortable with. But God can train you. Amen. Hallelujah. So the growing season is the best part in your life. Never be content satisfied with the major of growth you already have. Isn't that amazing how Christian says, I'm good where I'm at. I don't need to grow no more. They can do their job. They can go and help the church. I don't need to grow no more. I'm good. But what about if you look at the business side? On the business side, every business wants to grow. If you're hired on at a store that pays you hourly wage, you want to do your best. You want to do do more at the store. But by the time you're over here in the kingdom of God, where God supply all your need, where God is telling you, step in that position, and yet we sit there and say, I'm not going to grow no more. I'm good where I'm at. I don't have to worry about growing no more. Some of us will say, I'm getting too old anyway, so they don't need me. I'm going to retire. That's the problem. I one time I told my wife, I said, oh, well, I'm never going to retire from preaching. See, a lot of us wouldn't want to grow no more. We're so comfortable of where we at. We are so satisfied of where we at. We don't want to dig into the word even deeper. To have more knowledge, to have, be more wise about it. And that's why I'm saying, church, a lot of us, we're so comfortable where we at. A lot of us wouldn't want to dig into the word. Why? Because there's so much bylaws in the kingdom. Amen. It's amazing that sometimes. We as a body of Christ, all we think about is, I don't want to step up no more. I'm just fine where I'm at. I do my own thing. I come to church when I feel like it. Amen. 
We should be at a place that where we want to grow and grow and grow more in God. Not grow more in your flesh, but we need to grow more in God. Amen. But appreciate your growth that you experience this far. Amen. But never get comfortable to the point that you get to complacent, meaning self-satisfaction. Or you can say selfish. Amen. We get so, we get to a place that we get so comfortable like. Church member will show up, the last one to come in after service. They're the very first one out of that door. I don't want to see pastor. He's going to say, you should do this. Last one shows that they're the first one running out of that door. Amen. Always grow in God. There's always a growth in God. Always. Even though a person is like 70 years old, 70 or 75 years old, a person will still grow with that age. My pastor always says, always be teachable. Don't think you already know it all. Amen. Hallelujah. See, like I was saying earlier, in the business world, it's easy to understand why a lot of competitors out there for them business. But in the kingdom, I think a lot of us kind of look at it as a com competitive race where like, oh well, I can just kick back and coast and let everybody else do the fulfill the position. Some of us would say, I don't get paid in the church anyway, so bye-bye. But you know what? The work of your hands, when you do stuff in the kingdom of God, God's going to take care of your business. God's going to bless you abundance. Amen. The work of your hands, God will bless you. Amen. See, a lot of us, we say, we're just in the race. I'm in the race that we're achieving for God. I'm just looking to God. I'm not going to help out in a church. I'm not going to do nothing in church. I'm good where I'm at just as long as I read, just as long as I pray. I'm good. But God is saying, where's your heart? God is saying, the work of your hands, a blessing to me. See, we're talking about transition. Amen. Hallelujah. See, I myself, I want to grow in God. I got introduced to a book. And I want to buy that book. See, if you want to grow in God even deeper, it's going to cost you some money to grow. I'm not saying to give, but to buy materials for yourself to study at home. I was looking at this book, and it's a Bible. It's a commentary Bible. 
is written by Jimmy Swagner. Each book, Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, their books are this thick. It explains every part of it. It explains it all the way down to the nitty-gritty. Another pastor showed it to me. Blew me away. And I was telling my wife, I said, I want to get them books. It's going to cost me $500 to get all 37 books. It's a commentary Bible books. When you read that thing, Genesis 1, it'll give you more scriptures. It connects every single way. See, when you want to grow, you're going to buy every material list that you can find. You will find anything just to grow. Amen. Okay, let's go talk. We talked about plowing. So we're going to talk about winter season now. Winter season. What is the tool for winter season? Is the cross. Why cross? Because we plowed. Now we got to think about cross. Now we have to think about to study on that cross. See, plowing is difficult and the cross is deadly. Plowing is difficult, but the cross is deadly. Amen. It means to be. It is the vice of pain and death when you carry the cross. Amen. But it's not an ugly thing. This is actually one of the key to the kingdom. Carrying that cross is one of the key to the kingdom. Amen. To me, death is a word that describes a winter season. When God is after something, when he is trying to kill something in me. See, each and every one of us in this place, God is after something within you to kill and destroy. That don't line up with the word of God. That don't line up with his spirit. See, God wants to destroy some stuff within you that don't line up with his spirit. But a lot of us, we want to keep it. A lot of us, we don't want to let it go. There is so much things that happen in our past that we don't want to let go. But God is saying, we need to get rid of some stuff within us as a believer. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Like I said, when God's after something within you, he wants to kill that thing that's rooted within you. He wants to kill it so that he can give, let you be a brand new person that serves him. The cross is a key to the heaven. Hallelujah. Okay, let's go to Romans chapter 12 and verse 13. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, 12, 13. It's a good word, church. Hallelujah. It says, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do.
Next one. For if you live by his dictate, you will die. In other words, in other words, he's saying, for if you live by its control, you will die. That's sin. But if through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. Amen. So in other words, if you kill what I'm asking you to kill, what I am desiring to live in you and through you, you can come to life. Amen. In the kingdom, lead by one who dies and come back to life, Something must always be dying in order for us Christians always being seen things comes to life. But remember, dying daily, while it makes you dangerous and also makes everything more difficult. But some of us, when we think about God asking us to kill something, we get frustrated. See, God can tell you, let me separate you from your siblings. God can't do that. That's not God. You know what? God separated me from my family. That they serve, that they, that they go ahead and do an Indian religion. And God set me free. And said that, I want you to stay away from your family for a season. I'm going to set you apart from your family for a, for a season and for a reason until growth take place in your life. See, that was a frustrating thing I heard from God. I wasn't praising God and saying, yes. I'm going to be separated from my mom and dad. I'm going to be separated from my family. I wasn't praising God. It was frustrating because I was so close with my older brother. And that was frustrating to be away from him. That is why I'm saying when God wants to kill something within you, God is doing that for a reason. It's a season for you to change. See, a lot of us, we have friends. A lot of us, we have relatives, don't even go to church. A lot of us, we probably have siblings that still goes to the Indian religion and will still hang out with the family member. When they want to help with the ceremonies, we go over there real quick and help them out. But we can't agree on what the enemy does. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Something must always be dying in order for us to always be seeing things comes to life. Something always got to die in your life for things come to life in your lives. See, a lot of us, we love to hold on to some stuff that's been a hindrance to our, to our life with the walk of God. A lot of us, we want to hold on to some stuff. But yet we know it's a hindering what God is trying to do in your life. That's the reason why God set me apart from my family. My parents and my sibling, he set me apart for a reason. Now it's, it's a birth right here. I'm a pastor at this church. I never had a desire to be a minister. I never had a desire to be a Ron pulpit. But God had a plan. Only God spoke to my pastor and my pastor trained me up. Hallelujah. But remember, dying daily while it makes 
you dangerous, like I said. I also make everything more difficult in your life. So all those friends that you hung up with, that cusses and that drags you to smoke a cigarette, God can cut that off. So I want you to stay away from your friends until change take place, until that transition take place. After that transition take place, you can go back to them and witness about Jesus Christ. Transition has to happen in our lives. Like I always say, I can't change you. Only God can change you. If you want to change yourself, you're going to mess up. Why? Because you're not God. But if you learn how to put your trust in God for a transition in your life, now God's going to say, I'm going to change him. Why? Because he trusts me with all my heart. I put some stuff within him. I took up some stuff and said, I want to get this thing out of this person for it to die and get it out of there and get that root out of there. And now that I want to go ahead and take care of my child here and now transition going to take place. Hallelujah. You want, you want to know why? Those things, those roots been dead, tossed out of you. It comes back up. It comes back within you a lie. Why? Because that's your desire. I could have went back to the Indian religion. I could have went back to the Native American church. But I decided I love God so much. I decided to keep on serving God because God has been so good to me. Some of us, that marijuana and that cocaine and phenomy and that alcohol, we drink it because sometimes we say, my back hurts. Sometimes we say, I don't have joy. And that's why I drink that alcohol. And that's why I smoke that cigarette. That's why I smoke that marijuana. And that joy only lasts forever. But what about if you get to know my heavenly father for yourself and that joy will stay with you forever. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. I don't want to get so excited and start preaching. I want to slow down. Holy Ghost. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. You know, I just want to take off, but I cannot do that. Come on, Holy Spirit. But some of us, when we think about God asking us to kill something, Within us. We get so mad at God. The first thing we do is pray to God and say, Lord, how come you divided me from my, from my friends? How come you divided me from my, from my sisters, my siblings? But the Bible also tells us, lean not to your own understanding. Acknowledge all his ways, which is our heavenly father. Praise be to God. Probably because sometimes we as a believer, we may not understand why there's some stuff within us that's to be rooted out, that needs to be killed. Sometimes we don't understand why God wants to do that. The way things work in the kingdom of God when God is asking you, leading you, or making you kill something, get excited. Take it as a praising God. Compliment. When God is leaving, leading you, we should be able to praise God. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to change me. See, a lot of us, we get changed, and the first thing we do is, oh, church is boring. You know why it's boring? You make it boring. 
You know what? It's so sad you come to church. You make it sad because the joy of the Lord is my strength. Nobody ain't going to stop me. Nobody ain't going to stop my joy from God. Just as long as I praise God. Just as long as I worship God. Nobody ain't going to stop my praising. Nobody ain't going to take away my joy. A lot of us, when something goes bad, the first thing we do is our face is like this. When we come to church, this is how we sit when we're sad. When you praise God, or either that you're like, and then when you see a boyfriend, girlfriend, that comes into church, you'll be like this. Okay, even no lower. Maybe Pastor Burley sees you. Pastor calls you out your name. You'll be. See, nobody shouldn't take your joy no matter what. The first time I got saved, I did not even mention Jesus at my parents' house. I was so embarrassed calling out his name. But now I can go with her and say, I'm going to church. Now I can praise God and say, thank you, Jesus. I can pray over there right now. Because I know who I am in Christ. I know what God did to me. Because God's been so good to me. God has been so good. All my children are back in church. My son's even going back to church. All these years, my wife's been praying about it. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. See, God is trying to tell you these things. God wants to birth in you and through you. See, God don't want to use no filthy spirit. God don't want to use no filthy spirit to birth something into church. Amen. But it can't come to your life until we kill what God is desiring to be done. See, God wants to burst something within you. God wants to pray, pregnant in you a word. But God can't do that until what he tells you to kill within you. Now that God's going to birth some word within you. God will birth some fruits within you. Why? Because he said to kill these things that's within you. We're going to take that root out of there and I'm going to birth new fruits. I'm going to birth everything that you desire, son. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God wants something in you to die today. Some of us, we probably still carry that lustful spirit within us. And God's been telling you, get rid of that. Let's go kill that spirit. Let's go kill that lying spirit. Let's go kill that, duh, that doubt spirit. Let's go take that out. Let's go do that. And then I can burst something in you. So when I burst something in you, you're not going to doubt. When I burst something in you, you're going to bring it forth to believe that it shall come to pass. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's a good word, church. Hallelujah. See, the part of the fun, the part of the fun part about being a follower of Jesus and a son of God for you, figure it out. What is God asking 
you to kill today. Figure it out out today. What is God asking you to pull that root out of you? That's not even of him. That's wrong spirit that dwells within us. Those wrong spirit that's not even of God. God said, why don't you go ahead and kill those roots? Why don't you go ahead to cast out them demons out of you? Amen. Kill them spirit out of you today. Can you imagine if every day of your life you make you make sure some part of your flesh was killed? Can you imagine that every single day some part of it in your flesh you kill every single day you pray against it and ask God to deliver you from this spirit ask God to deliver you from all that bitterness ask God to deliver you from this gossip ask God and say Lord teach me how to pray to ask God said to let me pray every morning to every afternoon every night and ask God to order your step amen isn't that amazing that we ask God to kill something with this, us every single day? Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Yes. Can you imagine that every single day that you kill something in your flesh, what would it look like if you do that every single day? When God speaks to you and says, you need to repent. You need to do this. You need to get rid of this. Why don't you go ahead and get rid of that boyfriend because you're not even married. Make it right, he was say. Amen. Can you imagine what might come to life if you and I we're constantly putting to death the things that keep besetting us, the things that keep tripping us up. See, a lot of us, we trip over things that's not even of God. Plowing and pulling out them weeds, them thorns that we trip over. Pull them out. Isn't that amazing that sometimes we stumble of the things that we know that's not even of God and we still have it in our home, in our life, wherever we go. We still stumble on it, but yet when God speaks to us and tells you to get rid of that thing, but still we hold on to it. But once in a great while, we trip over it. And we know it. That's not of God, but we still hold it. I've been telling my wife, we had this turtle that my daughter made. It's a powdery turtle. You can blow it to a whistle. And God dealt with me so bad. I said, throw that thing away. That's an idol. I told my wife, it's just a whistle to keep it. When I slept one night, it was God was keep on reminding me. Finally got up. The next day, got it, took it down to the ditch and crushed that thing all the way to pieces with rocks. And you know what? To this day, I sleep well. Amen. I kind of did it myself because I used to blow in it. That's exactly what they do in the peyote meeting. So finally God said, get rid of it. I sure they get rid of it. Now I sleep well. There's things that within us we don't even know it's an idol to us. And God will sure point it out to you. Amen. And that's why I'm saying, church, God can say, throw those curtains away. 
No, that's my grandma made that. You know why I say that? Because sometimes spirit are left behind in those curtains. Why do I say that? Years ago, I have a good friend of mine. He's an elder at, the, at my home church. He said, I always see something at night, the black thing, walking around. He goes, I prayed. I did this. I said, what about your curtains? Throw those away. I said, he threw it away. That black thing didn't even show up no more. Hey, man. That's the key is death in the winter season for each and every one of us. See, I'd rather stay in the plow season and the winter season. Why? Because that's when you're going to die, kill your flesh, and die yourself to the Lord. I'm not saying die in the flesh, in the spiritual realm. We should be a dead man. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit takes our body over. There's nobody, not in his spirit, should not control you, not unless it's the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it hurts in the kingdom of our God's winter season. I was perceived season where something is birthed. If you are in a plain season, I want you to be encouraged. Isn't that amazing? Well, pastor, it's too hard. Let me tell you something. It's hard to fall and never repent. To get back up, it's hard. Even like the lack of reading the word of God. If you don't read that whole month, it's going to be hard for you to get back into the word and pray. We will get to a place that we don't even care no more, not care about. We don't even be bothered no more and we'll just come to church and go home. We won't even... Don't matter what the pastor says, and you know you're doing wrong, and pastor will say this and that, and you know that you're doing wrong, but we don't do nothing about it, and we just get so hard to the Word of God, and when the Word of God corrects you, we don't even move at all. See, those are the things that God wants to root out from you. Stubbornness spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. A lot of us say, Pastor, I had a bad day today. You don't even know. Praise the Lord. Every one of us go through every single day. One days are good, the next day are bad. We don't have no excuse. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's go to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 9, verse 6. Now, we're not, I know this talks about giving, but I, I'm using it as a principle. Hallelujah. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seed will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a glorious crop. See, that tells you, we got to plow all the time. If you don't plow, no seed is not going to grow within your heart. Like I was saying earlier, there's thorns and the word of God, the seed is not going to work together. You slowly going to drip away. If those thorns takes over your seed. So we got to keep on plowing. You don't only plow once in a great while. It should be a daily life. 
every single day we should plow. Plow on our hearts. If you know that there's something wrong that's not lined up with the word of God, we should be able to pray about it. Amen. Your transition will switch, will change only if you plow your heart every single day. Even the direction that you're going to go to, that God's going to lead you to. Sometimes it feels like it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it feels like it's too hard to move. Sometimes it feels like it's so hard to go that direction. But when you plow your heart and keep on throwing seed in your, on your heart with the word of God and let that word of God grow and grow and grow and deep within you. So even though it looks hard and you're not familiar where God is telling you to do a transition, to do a change in your life, it's not going to be a hard because you've been plowing every single day. You've been plowing every day. So when you plow, that means the word of God is going to grow within you. The word of God will going to stand strong within you. And that's why I'm saying, church, we as the body of Christ... We should be able to plow every single day from our heart. And that way, when transition takes place in your heart, in your life, it's not going to be hard for you. It's going to be hard for you to turn. When God tells you to pray, it will be easy for you to pray. When God tells you to lay hands on that person, you're not going to have no doubt. All you're going to say is, God said by his word, but by Jesus Christ's strife, he's healed in the name of Jesus. And that's why I'm saying, church, we as a body of Christ, that we need to plow every single day so that we can renew our mindset, so that we can talk to those spirits that don't belong within you, that you can cast a spirit that's not of God. And that's why I'm saying, church, we as a body of Christ, that we have a duty to power the wells within us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You guys don't realize that. What I'm doing are you draining me. But it's good. Spirit of the Lord is in this place. And that's why I'm saying, church, we as a body of Christ, we need to plow our heart every day. In other words, check yourself every day. Examine yourself every day to see if your prayer is growing, to see if you're meditating on the word, the time is extending. To see that if you're in the word, check yourself once in a great while. But what I'm saying is that then we need to be making that plow into a, rot a routine in our lives. See, a lot of us Christian folks, we love to pick up the Bible until we come to church. What good is it going to do when we just sit, when that Bible sits there? Let me have your Bible. What good is it going to do when your Bible sits there? <laughs> Hallelujah. Because where's your Bible? It's over there. See, one of the things is, like I said, what good is it going to do? Your Bible is on the shelf. When all hell breaks break loose, what do you guys do? Well, we sit there and put this Bible on our chest, acting like the Bible is going to save us. Oh, that, that yanny is not going to attack me. That skinny walker is not going to come around. I got the Bible on my chest. 
Some of us, we probably go along, along the house that night carrying that Bible. Look like you're on a mission. But all it is is just the word of God. But the word of God has to birth within you. The Bible don't say carry the word of God in your hand. He says the word of God has to be planted on your heart within you. So when all hell break loose, you can use the word of God. It didn't say to leave it on the shelf and protect you, but the word of God has been birthed within you. So when transition take place, you can pray against whatever is trying to stop your transition. You can start praying against it. It doesn't matter if people say that you're not going to get nowhere. It doesn't matter if people say you're not going to grow in God. All that matters is that when the word of God is within you, that you got to pray and pray it through during your transition. Man, even my phone's praising God over here. It's amazing. The how, how we don't even, don't even plow for nothing. It's amazing that we just want to just kick back. And just, we think that, oh, I go to church, so I'm good. Yeah, let me tell you something. The devil can be sitting right beside you. The devil can be sitting right over here and watching us. And then once you get out of this church, all hell is going to break loose. So what is that going to tell me? The word of God came on this ear, came out of this ear. Because you didn't rebuke it. You didn't even catch it. You didn't even know how to rebuke it and pray about it. You just went ahead and argued with your spouse. <laughs> Have we done that before my wife and I? Of course we did. We went to a church back home in Farmington. Got out of church that morning. My wife and I started arguing. And I didn't catch it. See, the biggest problem is we love this, had the lasso, some of us Christians. Amen. Praise the Lord. So plow every single day. So your crops can grow, which is the word of God. When the word of God is stable in your heart, has a deep root there in your heart. No matter all storm comes in, no matter all hell break loose, you will be still standing on the foundation of the word of God with the peace of God within you and you're going to crush that devil's head and say, devil, you're a liar. You're not going to destroy my family. You're not going to destroy my sibling. You're not going to be talking lies of me. Devil, you go back where you go back to. Hallelujah! See, some of us, we don't even praise God. This is how we walk. We don't even pick up our feet. Praise the Lord to crush that devil's head. When transition comes, go that direction. No matter it looks so hard to change. No matter it looks so hard if the church is doing a transition. We all got to get in unity for a transition for this church. To uplift one another. Hallelujah. Let's go to Galatians. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. So what we at? Okay. Hallelujah. I bet I can preach all afternoon till 5 o'clock. It says, remember this. Oh, so let not get tired of doing what is good. 
at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. If we don't give up, church. So in other words, when your transition comes and takes place, when it looks impossible, when it looks so hard, the Bible says, don't give up. Keep on doing good. Keep on going. Keep on praying. Keep on trucking. When that transition is taking place, keep on going. He said that you will reap a harvest just in time. He said, if we don't give up, don't give up when that transition comes. Oh, I don't want to be like that person. That person's how, how she is. That person how he is. I want to act like him when I get saved. We're not going to act like nobody else but ourselves. We got to act like our heavenly father. And all I'm saying is don't give up. When things change in your life, when everything changes in your life, don't give up. When that transition comes, don't give up. See, the biggest problem with us Christian folks is, oh, I used to do that. I missed that. That's what I used to do a long time ago. I missed that. Why would you want to go back and talk about what you used to do. And now that you're, you're missing that, remember that your tongue is so powerful. Our words are two-edged sword. Which is the word of God that tells us. You might as well just keep trucking and say, Thank you, Lord, for that transition, that change is going to take place in my life. Thank you, Jesus. And I want to do your will, Lord. And I want you to change me inside out in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Go ahead and play music. Do altar call, and if you need prayer, we'll pray with you. I know...